We live in a constantly changing world, but one thing remains the same. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest message in the history of the world. And the greatest need of our broken and sinful world. Hallelujah. The research on global Christianity reveals that Africa has the largest number of people professing to be Christians ahead of any other continent since 2018. Today, one in five of the world's Christians live in Africa, live in Kenya, live in Nigeria, live in Malawi, live in Botswana. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, Africa is the most youthful continent on the planet with 60% of the population under 25 years of age and projected to have the highest youth growth spread that will have 42% of the world's youth. Wow. The projection is that Africa, if, if things go the way it is, is likely to have more Christians in Africa, 1.25 billion, than in Latin America and Europe, and Europe combined. To whom much is given, to whom much is given, brothers and sisters, I feel that one of the things that we need to keep an eye on as we experience this tremendous growth by the grace of God, by the move of the Holy Spirit on our dear continent, is that we need to keep an eye on a Jesus brand of Christianity. We need to keep an eye on an untainted Jesus kind of Christianity. And so this morning or this afternoon, I want us to reflect with the few minutes that we have on the characteristics. What are the hallmarks of a genuine Christian faith? The world is calling for Africa. Where I live in Asia, surrounded by Two billion plus Muslims, Hindus, and uh, uh, Muslim Hindus and Buddhists. There's a call, like a Macedonian call. Africa, send, 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 send your children, send your men and women to the harvest fields that the Lord Himself is cultivating. Amen to that. But we need to go with a Jesus branded Christianity. Hallelujah. A dear friend of mine who loves the Lord, supports ministry, said recently on a platform that I'm part of that he, he worries about the fact that a lot of churches here in Africa are just a scam. You may or may not agree with him, but I want to be more humble when I hear things like that. We need to take heed and guard this gospel that was passed on to us by the apostles of old. And that's why we need to look at what are some signs that, are, that give us pictures of a genuine Christian faith. We had the passage read for us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 to, uh, to verse 10. And the testimony of the impact of the gospel in the church of Thessalonica is an incredible story that points us to this theme that we want to look at.
this morning. This is the account of the very first church in all of Europe. All of Europe. And it is Paul, Silas, and Timothy that had gone to Thessalonica and spent, as according to the scriptures we read, three Sabbaths, which implies three weekends. I don't know whether it was exactly three weekends, but whatever it is, it was under one man. And persecution broke forth, and Paul had to be bundled out of town for his safety. And so you can imagine, imagine from AIC here in Milimani going to Lodwa in the north and going there to spend time to proclaim the gospel and that within that short time to a, a people that have never heard the gospel before and then circumstances force you to get out of town. As a mother, as a father, I know you will feel for these new believers. In fact, it, it almost looks like the prospects do not look good because here are a, a, a group of brothers and sisters who have just come to faith in Jesus Christ and have been rendered pastorless, leaderless, leaderless. But you need to appreciate this story by going back to Acts 17, verse 1 to 4. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. That is the gospel. That the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. And he said, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. And what is the response? What is the response of this Early, early group of a multicultural audience. You know, some from Greeks and Jews, men and women. What is the response to this gospel that was proclaimed to them? And the scripture says, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number. Ooh. Large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, this morning, I want us to, to, to rise up be, or be awakened. Awakened to the truth that the gospel does work. Hallelujah. That the gospel does work. How in the world could it be that a message proclaimed to a group of people within a short time and then a leader leaves and then Paul was in Athens where you know when he, he, he was bundled out of that place he was in Athens. And he was feeling this concern, this heart concern for these brethren. And then he says, Timothy, please go and check on them how they're doing. And Timothy goes and he comes back. And what is the report? The report is so good. Wow, amazing. How could that be? How could that be? And I want to say, brothers and sisters, when the word of God comes with the spirit of God to the hearts of God's people, there is an unspeakable power at work. Hallelujah. It is a power that works. Why? Because it came from our father in heaven. The creator of the heavens and the earth and everything. It came 
from him. And it is bound, it is guaranteed to succeed. Hallelujah. So if you came to church this morning, I don't know the pressures that you walk into this auditorium with. The demands that are on you. The expectations that are placed on you. Hey, we are in God's presence. This is holy ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word of God is alive. The gospel works. Our mandate is simply to proclaim it. When it is preached, when it is read, when it is sung, like we had our brothers and sisters sing beautifully to us, it is nothing less than the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you glad you are in church this morning? Wow, it's the word of God. We got something special. Money cannot buy. Money cannot buy. Can we fall in love with God's word afresh? A fresh wonder. Maybe some of you, you have become so familiar with maybe church and all the symbols and you know things about church and that you 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 are even losing that sense of wonder of this gospel that we have. Number one, all I want to say from this scripture is that a sign of an authentic Christian faith, a sign of a genuine, a genuine work of God, not a counterfeit, is a reliance on the word of God. The testimony of God. The second point I want to make is that Paul gets this report that we remember before our God and Father. Oh no, it's a prayer. Paul, Paul writes in response to the report that as a result of what we heard, we are prioritizing the issue of prayer and we pray for you before our God and Father for your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Wow, those three things. Wow, it, 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 I think it summarizes a lot of things for us. Works of faith expressed in loving deeds and pressing forward with steadfast hope in Christ Jesus. What else? What else do we need? What else do we need? What else do we need? Faith, love, and hope. God has one purpose for the realm of time and space to reveal himself through his son and to build an eternal body of believers which is mature in Christ, filled with the knowledge of the son of God who will glorify him and enjoy him forever. Turn to your neighbor and say, it is us. We are the body, it is us. 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 It is God's plan that through us, that through this assembly, African inland church, Milimani, from this assembly will proceed forth the word of God through men and women from this congregation not only to the nooks and crannies of this country, but throughout Africa and to the rest of the world. Do you believe it? Oh, I'm not hearing amen. Oh. What time is this, my people? What time is this? What time is this? When I was six years, seven years, I used to carry the tools of my father, 
My father was an electrical technician, and I'll carry his tools to the homes of missionaries to go and, and sort some of the problems there. The light is not on, and the bulb fix the bulb, this and that and that. And I used to carry the tools. I never knew that me too, look at me, me too can be a missionary. I never knew. I never knew. It never even crossed my mind. But thanks be to God. Praise God for, for grace and the mercy of God that you and I, every one of us, we have become instruments for God's heart for the nations. And he accomplishes his sovereign purposes through us, through us, through us. We need to be a congregation, a people that is trusting Jesus. That's the faith part. Walking in faith, placing our trust not in man or circumstances or things, but in Jesus Christ. Trusting Jesus produces gospel fruit. Amen. We got to love. We got to love. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So we receive the love of our brother, our father. And the appropriate response is that this love that has been poured on us, this love that has secured our eternal life in Christ Jesus, the appropriate response is to express this love by serving others. Serving others. How are you serving others? In your office, in your community, in your family. How is a reflection, a response to this love? How is that looking like at your marketplace? There's a picture that I wanted us to see. Uh, if my brother can show that. My sincere apologies to those of you who might be offended by this picture. Each time I wrestle with it myself, whether is it appropriate to show this picture? But I want to assure you that so far as they are concerned, they are appropriately dressed. And uh, this is way back in the early 60s. And four bears of the organization that I serve with, in response to this message of works of faith, loving deeds, and steadfast hope in Christ Jesus, they went to this people group. And this group of people you see there, these are the leaders of the church. You know, when you, when you have synod, uh, do you have a synod? Yes. How do you call it? FCC synod. This is synod picture you are seeing in 1963. And the question is, does this gospel work? Does it work? Does this gospel work? Can we believe this gospel? Oh yes, it does work. And today, out of the feeble efforts of people, simple people, who just responded in obedience, today we have one million members across eight regions and other islands in Indonesia. I spent time with them three years ago. It was a wonderful time. They teach me how to love Jesus. They teach me how to suffer for Jesus. In fact, the, when I left that place and uh, just sitting in, in this MAF small plains from, from, from the forest, I asked myself, wow, 
how may I suffer more for Jesus? Because that's the issue. The issue is, how may I suffer more for Jesus? They, they taught me. I said I was going there like a guest speaker. But I learned more from them. And today they have more than 7,000 ordained pastors serving amongst 8,000 churches. 500 local evangelists. And I heard that they recently sent a missionary to serve in Uganda. Just next door. Just next door. So, a mark of an authentic Christian faith is hard work. Hard work. Diligent work of faith, of love, and of hope. Amen. And of hope. We need to keep hope alive. We need to keep hope alive. Hope anticipates the future. Hope, hope looks beyond the barriers, the walls, the challenges of today. Hope placed in Jesus Christ says that I have some huge challenge as I sit in church this Sunday afternoon. But I choose to place my trust in Jesus. And I know that tomorrow is going to be better than this afternoon. Hallelujah. And even if tomorrow comes and the situation doesn't change, I'm going to keep keeping on. Keep going and pressing forward in him. Then the third one, the gospel came to you not in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Other versions say, the gospel, our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. Many believers around the world, this is the challenge. There is a loss of conviction. A loss of conviction. People today choose which aspect of the scriptures they have to believe. And even try to rewrite the scriptures. May we in Africa be a people that is growing more and more from one degree of glory, one degree of understanding in deep convictions about God and his word and his work. I believe as I gave those statistics that the men and women that we have to send to the nations of the world, they will need to carry with them the Jesus brand of Christianity. And I like the testimonies that we hear from, from people. You know, you have your, 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 you have your son, you have your daughter living in Europe, living in Asia. You know, you've sent people all over the world. And some of them uh, an open display of the gospel. Praise the Lord. And we need to be praying for them. What I'm saying is that we need to be a people that continue to demonstrate deep spirituality and transformational discipleship. Hallelujah. People who hold fast, who hold firm to deep commitment to prayer and the study of God's word. People who understand what a sense of family is, a sense of community. People who say, this is all I have, but you don't have it. And I'm prepared for you 
to take what I have. That sense of family, that sense of caring, that sense of community. That's what the gospel is about. That is the brand, the Jesus brand that we take to the world. Hallelujah. People who will evidence a fresh sense of confidence and conviction that gospel does impact society. Time is, I can see that very soon the singers will come on the stage, so I better hurry up. <laughs> so a mark of an authentic Christian faith is one that has deep convictions. Deep convictions that takes the word of God seriously. That takes God seriously. Takes power seriously. Is has no, I mean like we need to be unapologetic about a work of constant reliance on the Holy Spirit. And that is the mark of an authentic Christian faith. Let me go to point number four. It says, they tell us, and this is Paul speaking, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. How you turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Somebody say, said, the heart is an idol factory. And at any point in time, if we are not alert, if we are not pressing forward in God, this heart of mine, in spite of all the experiences that I've had, could be a very prolific production point <laughs> of idolatry. Where is your allegiance? Where is your allegiance? Are we ready to die for this gospel? Are we ready to die for this gospel? In every true conversion, there is a turning not only from sin to Christ, but from darkness to light. Hallelujah. From the power of Satan to God, and from idols to serve the living and true, and true God. There's also a rescue from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the son God loves. Hallelujah. You know, I, I don't have time, but I, I, I'm tempted to share this testimony of a missionary who was working amongst a group of women in the, amongst the Kikuyu, you know, group of women. And then this missionary was preparing them for baptism. And before the baptism, he said, oh, let, let, me, let me just conduct a little assessment, you know. And, and so she asked this grandmother of mine, let's just call her Tata. Is that, is that, is that, yes, let's just call her Tata. And he's like, oh, Tata, tell me something. Tell me something about, about Jesus. And he said, oh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. He said, no, tell me something he ever did. He said, I haven't been to school. I'm an illiterate. I, I, I don't know. And then, and then the missionary said, oh, Tata, maybe we should delay the baptism so that we ensure that we don't baptize somebody who doesn't have a testimony. And on hearing the word testimony, Tata screamed. She said, what do you mean? Testimony? How can you say I don't have a testimony? When Jesus Christ has delivered me from witchcraft, forgiving me my sins and brought me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. And you tell me that I don't have a testimony? And then the missionary said, oh, 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 ta, 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 ta. you can be baptized. You can be baptized. It's about testimony. It's the power. And I think we in Africa, we stand on the shoulders of many tatas in the villages, literate Illiterate, poor, rich, 
you know, all kinds of people. God in his sovereignty and grace is mobilizing, has used all these folks to advance his eternal purpose. Number five, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the land. Quickly, I just want to say this is a key point about the integrity of the message and the messenger. The, 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 there has to be a correlation between the message and the messenger. The message and the messenger ought to be what? Aligned. And then the final one. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. This one really gets me all the time. You know, the gospel comes from the Lord. And he says, when the gospel came, you welcomed it. You welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering. It's not just suffering, but it says what? Severe suffering. With joy given by the Holy Spirit. So joy is given by God himself. By God himself. I know you guys are here. Let me share this testimony. I went to the, the, the border, the, the, the border of Thailand in the midst of all the things we've been hearing about Myanmar. The, the military, everything. I won't go into details. But some dear friends of mine, because of what was going on, they decided to put up some accommodation facilities across the border. So that, because what was happening was that your brother or sister goes to bed and the following morning, they don't see him. They don't see your sister. Things are happening, I won't go into details. So it's like, oh, come and use these accommodation facilities. And our brothers and sisters, the church in this country, they said, thank you for the facilities. We want to stay here with our brethren in the village, in the towns, the church of God. We choose to die with them here than come and use those facilities across the border. You know, when I heard it, I cried. I said, Lord, I have so much to learn every day. And I'm telling you, one of my colleagues, he has lost 10 of his friends. But I know they receive this word of God. They welcomed it, even in severe suffering. And the gospel is growing in spite of the news in spite of what is going on. That picture is a picture from Cambodia where at one stage in the height of the civil war, as many as two million Cambodians lost their lives, including as the record says, all the Christians. But in the refugee camps, the seed of the gospel was growing again. Just a few weeks ago, that picture you see is 100 years anniversary of the church in Cambodia. And I can tell you, the previous picture is a picture of their prime minister. Cambodia at some point was the second hardest place in terms of reception to our gospel, to this gospel. The first one is Saudi Arabia, and Cambodia was the first. But today, every province has a gospel presence. Hallelujah. I was in a church, only 100 members, and they, they, they were trusting the Lord. They, oh, we too, we want to be part of God's work of sending his children to the nations of the world. 100, congregation, congregation 100 people. 
I traveled there and preached my heart out. I said, you guys can make it because I've been to Latin, uh, some of these countries in Latin America, 50 member congregation, 150, 200, and they are sending to the nations of the world. I said, you guys, you too. By the grace of God, you can do it. And everyone in the congregation, children's service, whether it was 10 cents or 20 cents, 50 cents, one dollar, whatever, they, they, they brought the money together to cut a long story short. Our sister, they laid hands on her and she started working in Thailand. I've just heard that she's now serving in Zambia. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a church of 100 people. What time is this? Brothers and sisters, may we be a people that keep an eye, an eye on the elements, the characteristics of a genuine Christian faith, even as we talk about so much growth of Christianity in Africa. Remember, there are more people in the world today than ever who have never heard the gospel meaningfully. I was in a conference just two weeks ago, and I, I saw on the screen there are some places that 50 years ago there was no gospel presence. And here we are, just two weeks ago, all these church leaders, blah, 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 in a room. 50 years after, this, this, the story is still the same. No gospel presence. To whom much is given, much is expected. Finally, one of my sobering scriptures is Acts 13, verse 36. It says, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, what happened? Fell asleep. Fell asleep. What are you prepared to do for this gospel? What kind of investment will you make with the treasure of your life? I want to leave you with this question. Will you serve your own purposes or you will seek to serve the purpose of God in your generation and this time? Remember, the signs of a genuine faith, the power of God's word, hard work of faith, love, and hope, receiving the gospel in word, in power, and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Remember, it is about a changed life. And I saw that on your board this morning. You know, transformed to do what? I, let's, it's, it's about a changed life. And to go forth and have the power of God change others. It's also about an unmistakable evidence of word and deed, integrity. And it's also about receiving this gospel that is from our Father in heaven. To receive this gospel work through suffering. Through suffering. In the first service, I forgot something. Look at the verse 2 of that passage. Paul says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. May we be a family that is always praying. Hallelujah. That is the mark of a genuine, authentic expression of faith. May the Lord bless us. Father, thank you. Thank you for the power of your word, your word alone as you have made it is enough to speak for itself. It's enough to convict. It's enough to transform. Lord, I pray that by your grace and mercy awaken us afresh. Let there be a fresh outpour of the Holy Spirit that we will rise up with an undivided dedication 
of walking with the purposes of God of trusting you pressing forward in you expressing that in loving deeds and a people that have our hope placed in Christ Jesus do your work oh father have your way and it's my prayer that out of this congregation even if I don't believe even if we don't believe that you will relocate people in this congregation to the nations of the world that they will be your ambassadors and point people to Christ Jesus. We pray even in Jesus' name.